to be back. So uh, why don't we begin, try to set a very special motivation in the first class, especially for the whole sequence of our study. So if you're like me, uh, you can't immediately switch into deep concentration or any concentration. So it's better to start sequentially by watching something very easy to find, the breathing, and then to move your way to something more subtle, the mind, and eventually when we meditate on bodhicitta and emptiness within that quiet mind, is a good prelude to that. So even be before watching the breathing, think I'm going to be doing this, in, not, sh not just to relax, but in order as a prelude, as a preliminary to concentration, to develop my mind so that I can have the right facilities, the right conditions to de develop bodhicitta and the wisdom of realizing emptiness. So with that, that kind of thought, focus on your respiration. As you're beginning on the gross level, remind yourself to relax with every breath. Breathe out the tension. That's it, Dorothy. And also relax your mind. Like all the events that we encounter, the breathing has these four cycles of rising, seemingly abiding, right at the end of the inhalation, slow dissipation, and a state of emptiness at the end. Like the stages of the universe, like the stages of the meeting and disappearing of friends and wealth and beauty and lifespan.
when you reach a little bit of stability and letting go of other thoughts, you can just focus on the breathing somewhat. Move to a more subtle level. Follow a breath down to your heart chakra area. Leave your attention there, giving up your attention to the breathing. See if you can begin to watch, recognize the conventional clear light nature of your mind. familiar with this meditation, recognizing all of the appearances to your mind, whether they be via the senses or just mental images in your mental consciousness, as a, mental consciousness alone, all like projections on a screen or clouds in the sky. Even the seeming solidity and presence of your body just an appearance to your consciousness rather than focusing on it assenting to its seeming existence try to perceive the consciousness to which that appearance is arising the clear light nature and let the appearances disappear, dissipate. It doesn't happen just simply by thinking once like that. You have to apply repeatedly that mode of thinking, letting go of the thoughts, letting go of the appearances, trying to perceive the clear light nature. The nature of the mind, the substratum within which those appearances are arising, the sense of self also just an appearance to your consciousness For this short time, I have this clarity of mind that I can perceive. I have a perfect human rebirth in which I've encountered the Dharma in a state of freedom. I'm not encumbered by having committed very negative actions in the past that will preclude my having a continuity of 
rebirths. I have faith in the Dharma. The Dharma still exists as a living entity and as do communities and benefactors to practice. everything that I need to practice the Dharma and, and achieve the great states of awareness and kindness that the, the Buddha and other Bodhisattvas in the past, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have achieved. First, not understanding the evolution of what appears to me, the outer world, my own experiences, feeling that there's something truly, substantially existent, not recognizing karma, past and future lifetimes. I've wandered in cyclic existence, wanting to be happy, wanting to have friends, wanting to be loved, wanting to be successful. but never quite understanding why it didn't happen the way I wanted to, continuously. Now I have this opportunity to cultivate my mind as the great beings of the past have done in the tenets of the various philosophical systems that Lord Buddha himself proposed, that he, he himself presented. For the purpose of overcoming my own faults so that I'm less a problem for others, so that that I can eventually bring joy and happiness to them. To indirectly also bring about my own happiness, power, peace of mind, serenity. I'm going to listen to, study, contemplate, and also try to meditate, familiarize myself with these various stages of philosophical insight that the Buddha taught. Not just as an intellectual exercise, but as a Dharma practice, so that I can benefit all living beings. And bring your attention back to the present. And welcome again. We're going to be studying one of the texts uh, that is traditionally studied in the monastic system in the Tibetan tradition. Um, it's not just a Tibetan trip. It's something that the, uh, the scholars of uh, India also, they themselves took part in. If you look in the, in the uh, history of the, the Lanrim gurus, the lineage lamas of the stages of the path, you find many of them were great scholars and who had studied these very subjects that we're beginning to study now. Maybe kind of like you're walking in the footsteps 
of them. They've left some imprints before. Now you're, maybe you can make them a bit deeper so that others can go in the future. Without, without us, without we, without us learning these things, is that right? Without us learning these things, Pardon? I don't know. <laughs> Probably worse. Without us learning these things, who's going to uh, who's going to teach it in the future? Are we going to rely for you know a hundred generations on non you know native speakers? So I think all of you have a chance as you understand this to share it in some way, and maybe some of you will become teachers. Some of you will use it mainly as an aid for your own meditation. One of my teachers, Geshe Jampa Tekchok, who is the former abbot of Sarah Jay, who taught us extensively at Manjushri Institute uh, many years ago, before he was uh, the abbot of Sarah, he used to like to say when we studied tenets, because sometimes it can seem like just a philosophical subject, he, he liked to say that uh, one term, one semester, you know, whatever it is, three months, six months, studying tenets is of more value than doing a three-month or six-month Vajrasattva retreat. You know, you can, you can kind of feel doing Vajrasattva retreat. You know what Vajrasattva is, right? Purification retreat. You think, well, that's real practice. This is just study. But unless you understand something about, you know, what you're meditating on, unless you have some idea of emptiness, um, the, the purification itself won't be quite as profound as you imagine. One of the, um, one of the quotations I'd like very much is in the, um, one of the first pages of this text, which was translated by Geshe Zopa, one of my great teachers, and Jeffrey Hopkins, great American scholar, it's in the second part of this book, now called Cutting Through Appearances. It's republish, republishing of a book, um, I used to think it used to be called Theory and Practice of Tibetan Buddhism, or Practice and Theory of Tibetan Buddhism. So if you have that on your bookshelf and you say, I have that, yeah, that so that a little bit um, cheeky of Snow Lion, to, not to say on the cover, you know, but anyway. Um, at the beginning of the text somewhere, there's a nice quotation of, of the Buddhas. In the descent, of Lanka, the descent into Lanka Sutra, the Lankavatara Sutra, the Buddha said, my doctrine has two modes, advice and tenets. To children, to the childish, I speak advice. And to yogis, tenets. So, this, this word, uh, tenet, uh, siddhanta in Sanskrit, we say, when we study it in the monasteries, we say, well, what are you studying? You're studying drupta. Um, sort of like, in a, drup means established, and ta means limit or extreme. So it's like kind of setting out the, the boundaries of what exists and what doesn't exist to a certain extent. The text that we're going to be going to be using is one that's studied at Sarah J Monastery in uh, formerly in Tibet, now both in Tibet and in uh, in India it has a branch. And this is a text by uh, the Yiksha writer, the the uh, textbook writer of Sarah J, Jason Chuki Gelson. So before we studied, remember when we studied um, Lorig, who was the author? No, it was, it was um, Prabhuchok. Prabhuchok, remember the actual text that we were studying. Okay, Champa, Champa Prabhuchok, yeah? thank you. Good test, it's very kind of you. And uh, but most of the other most of the other uh, textbooks that are studied, the main texts are by Jason Chuki Gelson. He's kind of like the textbook writer of Sarah J. 
Uh, there's a couple, of course, they do study some Lama Tsongkhapa's texts, they do study the sutras themselves, but he's kind of like their, their monastic textbook writer. So this is a very, Jason Tricky Gelson is considered to be one of the great, great scholars of uh, Tibet and um, kind of an emanation of Manjushri himself. And his texts are very, very revered. Also, we have the good fortune of having available uh, this text I'd mentioned to you by uh, Kuntruk Jigme Wangbo, I think, who was supposed to be a, a, a uh, incarnation of uh, Jamyang Shepa. This is in the second half of this book, Cutting Through Appearances, as we're, as we're joking. Just trying to find the title page here. Precious Garlets, Garland of Tenets. So this was translated by Jeffrey Hopkins and, and uh, mainly with the help of Geshe Ladrup Sopa many years ago. And this is a very similar kind of presentation. So this would be a very good kind of uh, balance. And also it has a little bit of commentary between the places and it, it says things in a different way uh, than this text does. So this would be a very good uh, help. Also it has a... Um, I think a glossary at the back if you're interested in Tibetan and Sanskrit terms and an index and things. So this is a, this would be a good one. The first part of the, this text is a commentary to the preliminary practices, to the kind of the um, meditation that's done like Giorgio before meditating on the stages of the path by the fourth pension lama. So this, that's why it was originally called Theory and Practice of Tibetan Buddhism. So that's a very good text. Then also some of you have a text that was just, that uh, just came out when His Holiness taught, at least to some degree, taught tenets in New York City recently. Is that it? Is no, that the name? Okay. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's, that is called what? What's the title, Frank? Buddhist philosophy. Yeah. Buddhist philosophy. Or philosophies philosophy. So that's just been recently published. I, I took a look through that and that is um, a little less precise. It doesn't go into, it doesn't give definitions and divisions in the same way that this text, Jason Chugi Gelson's text, and Kuntruk Jigme Wangbo's text do. And there, that's kind of like the tradition that we'll be using. Another uh, useful aid. There are probably several things for the different tenets. There are different texts of the different tenets, but one thing I've found over the years very, very useful. <clears throat> Meditation on Emptiness by Jeffrey Hopkins, this big, big tome. Uh, it talks about the various philosophical schools, especially talks about emptiness. So it's, if you ever have a chance to, uh, you want to investigate certain points. Also, this has some good, um, discussion of the minds and mental factors of our other class. And that's been reprinted in paper, I think, recently, so that's a little more available. For those of you that might want to um, study a little bit of Tibetan, I've got the text in uh, Tibetan itself, and you can make photocopies, so you might like to. We won't necessarily have a class of Tibetan on this class. We might do, might, might do a little of this on Thursdays before the other class. Uh, either of this or the uh, the mind and mental factors. So let's take a look at our our text. What do you think? Should we dive in? So this text, the title is uh, just a presentation of tenets. Actually, the Tibetan says the. Uh, the, the presentation of tenets, which is composed by Jason Jambel, Jambe Yang, Chuki Gelson. So Chuki Gelson is considered to be uh, sort of an emanation of Manjushri. This particular text that we're using was translated by our dear friend, Venerable Sangi Khandro. And I think it's gone over some slight editing, but I think we'll make, we'll probably find some things that we want to say in a different way anyway. But anyway, this is, this is a very good, pretty good translation. So, if you get to page one, 
which is like third page in or something like that. <clears throat> the text begins with the homage. Um, Lama Gombo Jambe Yang Dang Ngo Yer Machibe Jesun Damba Namla Chaksalo in Tibetan. Homage to all those, to all who are holy and venerable, existing inseparable in entity with Lama Protector Manjushri. Here it says Jampel Yang. I don't know, do you know in Tibetan, do you know what the name? You know the name, uh, the Sanskrit name Manjushri, right? You've heard. Do you know what it is in Tibetan? Is it Tibetan for that? So actually, Man, Manjushri, I think, is uh, Jampel. Pel means glorious, like Shri. Jampel. Um, sometimes you see Jampel, Jampe Yang. Do you know what Yang means, by any chance? Yang, this Yang means... Uh, this, the um, sort of melodious, it refers to his speech, gentle uh, speech, melodious speech, um, in Sanskrit, gosha. So, jampe, jampeyang is manju gosha. It's another way of saying his name, a different kind of, it's a different name, right? Man, man, manju gosha and manjushri. <clears throat> Sometimes the Tibetans write the two together. They write Jampel Yang, like Jampel meaning Manjushri, and then Gosha. But I don't. I've never. I can't remember seeing in Sanskrit Manjushri Gosha. Usually it's e either Manju Gosha or Manjushri. So, but here when it's talking about the the protector Manjushri, it's not exactly protector. The word is Gombo in Tibetan, which means uh, in Sanskrit Nath or Nata. Do you know that word? Have you heard that? Like Maitreya Nath. The, the Lord Maitreya, or uh, here when we, one of the epithets of Lama Tsongkhapa is uh, Manjunath, or Jamgon, the protector Manjushri, sort of emanating, as though Manjushri emanating in bodily form. So I think the implication of this at the beginning is uh, showing that it's, kind of indirectly showing that it's uh, a Gulukpa text, because it's paying homage to all those venerable and holy ones who are inseparable in nature with Guru or Lama Sunkapa, in other words. It says Lama Gompo Jambayang. So to in the, especially in the Gulukpa tradition, when we do um, Lama Chopa Puja, do you know Lama Chopa? The Guru Puja? We try to imagine the guru as a, a, an emanation of Lama Tsongkhapa. Lama Tsongkhapa, because we're studying in this particular tradition of this great yogi, scholar, saint. And when we do, even when we do the uh, the Gandhan Lagima, also this kind of like the short guru yoga of Lama Tsongkhapa, we try to see our own guru as an emanation, as inseparable in uh, in entity, being Buddha inseparable with Lama Tsongkhapa. So this is this is right at the beginning, paying homage to his own guru and to all the gurus who are inseparable with Lama Tsongkhapa, who teach that same that same kind of incisive, precise, very clear wisdom. So the text begins to explain the presentation of tenets. There are three points. Actually just that it says there are de definitions, divisions, and the meaning of the individual div uh, divisions. So basically, um, each of the you know every topic that we talk about, there will be uh, there will be definitions of things, and then if there are divisions, and then uh, some explanation delineation of the divisions themselves. So this is just like a very gross outline of the text. First. The definition of a proponent or propounder of Buddhist tenets. So this is kind of interesting because the uh, when it says a propounder of Buddhist tenets, actually the text says um, Nangba Sangepe Jupta Mawa Kangzaki Sani. It means the definition of a person who propounds or or 
is a proponent of Nangpa Sangepe Drupta, of tenets of the, of the insider Buddhist. Sometimes, we, have you heard, ever heard the word Nangpe Chu? When we talk about uh, Buddhist, Buddha Dharma, we usually don't talk about, uh, actually there is a word in Sanskrit, Buddha Dharma, but often in, uh, in, the, in the scriptures it comes uh, nang, Nangpe Chu. Nangba means inner, as opposed to, uh, to those who are outside, who are kind of heterodox, sort of like the orthodox as opposed to the heterodox, or, or inner beings. My teacher Lama Yeshe used to say that the Tibetans don't, uh, that Buddhists don't generally refer to themselves as Buddhists per se, um, especially in the northern Indian tradition, they refer to themselves as Nangba, inner beings. And one of the sort of special meanings of that was that they, were, they sought their direction inside rather than through manipulating the outer world. So here it says, uh, the, uh, the, pro the definition of a person who propounds these orthodox Buddhist tenets, literally what it says, something like that, or the inner Buddhist tenets, is a proponent of tenets, first of all, someone who holds some kind of philosophical system, who accepts the three jewels as ultimate objects of refuge. Actually, the, the word in the text is, I'm not sure, it's just a loose translation of ultimate. Yang Daktu maybe um, accepts the three jewels as the real objects of refuge, or the actual objects of refuge, or the perfect objects of refuge, and does not assert any objects of refuge other than these. This is the definition of a proponent of Buddhist tenets, according to Jason Chugi Gelson. Does that make any sense? If you take a look, it's kind of interesting to, uh, to cr make cross-reference. In uh, Kuntruk Jigme Wangpo's book, he has a, uh, a definition of a propounder of Buddhist tenets. First, he gives a little bit of uh, explanation of the non-Buddhist systems, which our text doesn't go into. Maybe in, in a certain way, unless you're reading these old, old texts, some of these non-Buddhist systems don't have, not always, in a direct correlation with uh, our other religions of today. It's not like talking about the Muslim and Christian and Jewish and uh, present Hindu religions. Let's see if I can find here. Do you see the, in here, when it talks about, pardon? The definition, here we go, on page 176, if you have this, it says the definition of a propo proponent of Buddhist tenets, so that's the same thing we have, is a person who asserts the four seals, which are the views testifying that a doctrine is Buddha's. This is a completely different definition, right? So one's wrong and one's right, right? How could they both be a definition? Something only has one definition, right? No? Did you say no? In our dictionary, we always have words that have more than one Yeah, that's different things. We're talking about one thing. You know, like you might, you might say a certain word is defined as meaning this and defined as meaning that, having different meanings. But here, we're, we're, still, we're just talking about really Buddha, a proponent of Buddhist teachings, of, of Buddhist tenets, philosophical schools. Well, in your own system, you should only have one definition for each object. One object can only have one definition. But other people may define it slightly differently. That's when debate can kind of uh, be very fruitful, because you want to see then, you might say, you know, you read this, or you're debating with someone who's studied this text, and you say, oh, that's not the right definition. You're wrong, you know? And the other person will say, no, you're wrong. This is the right definition. So you have to check to see um, you know, which is the actual case. Sometimes they're talking about exactly the same thing, just in slightly words, slightly different words. But here, there's, there, there are two different approaches, I think to um, kind of the definition of a proponent, 
proponent of Buddhist tenets. Generally, someone who is <coughs> a Buddhist is someone who takes refuge in Buddha Dharma and Sangha from the depth of their heart, right? Here it says the definition of a person who is a proponent of Buddhist tenets is a proponent of tenets who accepts the three jewels as the actual or the perfect objects of refuge, correct objects of refuge, and does not assert any objects of refuge other than these. So it's very similar to that except for the fact that it says a proponent of tenets. So in other words, it's kind of a Buddhist who is propounding tenets, right? Whereas here, it's giving one of the more, um, it, when you just talk about someone who propounds Buddhist tenets, the, te the definition in Kondruk Jigbe Wangpo's text is something that's also found quite often when you talk about someone who propounds, uh, is a proponent of Buddhist tenets, who, who holds Buddhist tenets. That is someone who, um, asserts the four seals, which are the views testifying that a doctrine is, a, is one of Buddha's doctrines. Do you know what the four seals are? We talked about this several times in the past. You have them right there. You know them. But Frank doesn't know them. No, he does now. He has the text on his lap. Maureen, do you remember us talking about the four seals? The four seals, I don't remember what they are. Mm -hmm. Pardon? 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 They are not the four. They are not the same thing as the four truths. The four comes a lot of times. <laughs> Venerable, do you know what the? Uh... Yeah, this is the right on, uh, No, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Do you remember from other contexts? <laughs> do you remember from other contexts what the four seals are? Four seals. So, it, this word, uh, Tibetan word, chakya, uh, or mudra. Is it you know sometimes we talk about the ornaments on the tantric deities are called mudras or the uh, the consort is called a mudra or something like that. This is not the same thing. Here, when we talk about maha mudra, the great seal, it refers to on some level the great seal of voidness that that testifies that all phenomena actually exist. That something is uh, as as Kriti Sanchar Rinpoche said on several occasions, a seal is kind of like uh, testifies that you've actually, say you've got, you've got a certificate from the university, but without the seal and the stamp on it, other people say, well, this is, you could have written this. You know, it doesn't have the university seal on it, the stamp on it. So a seal here, seals, these four seals are kind of um, doctrines that if you accept them, that your, that your tenants accept these, that at least that is a an indication that it could be Buddhist doctrine. If they violate these four seals, you, you would say, okay, this falls outside the Buddhist doctrine. This is not uh, inner, inner beings doctrine. 